The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, this is the time in our worship service where we worship through the proclaimed Word of God, and we're going to turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, if you'll turn with me there. And we're going to study through, uh, we've been studying through 2 Peter as a church, and we're, we're looking at this first section in verses 1 through 11, and we're calling it Blessed Assurance. That is what Peter is after, the assurance that comes from the power of God, changing us from the inside to the outside and bringing about transformation. And that's why I asked Mike to open our, our time together with the beauty of what God has done in that special man's life. He was my hero uh, growing up. He was that older brother that everybody always wanted. And so what a joy to see what God's done in his life. So let me read our section, and we will pray and open the word. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. For by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. And now for this very reason also applying all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence knowledge, and in your knowledge self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. And for in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for the privilege to worship the living God. I thank you for our time of worship this morning, ascribing all that glory to you. I thank you for Mike's testimony. Lord, his only desire was that you would get all the glory, and we just smell the aroma of Jesus Christ and your glory filling this place. And so we thank you that you granted him his prayer and his desire and his request. Thank you that you could take someone locked up in a house and glorify your name in such a beautiful way here this morning. Thank you for that. Thank you for the power of this gospel. And thank you for what we're going to look at this morning. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would just come now in power. And that we would understand this and that we would find the source of life and godliness. That we would find the power of transformation in your Son. God, put Jesus Christ on display now. Lord, glorify your Son, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me set out our context of where we've journeyed in this epistle as of this morning. It began with those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. Faith is the key that unlocks all the promises of God. And it's received as a gift from God. He gives it to you. We should never get over what God has given to us in the gift to see and believe this gospel. This faith opens our eyes to the need of righteousness. God demands a perfect divine righteousness if you will ever be in his presence. And faith shows us that God requires of us uh, what he requires of us to be in his favorable presence. And to do that, he gives it to us. His son came and lived a perfect life, and now God gives that to us, to our account. 
Faith quits trying to rub up against the law and achieve your own righteousness, to quit trying to clean yourself up and get yourself right with God. Faith looks past that now to the Son of God. It holds out an empty hand called faith, and it receives the free gift of God, His righteousness perfect, given to you, not in stages, not merited, not not applied. It's given fully and bountifully by the grace of God. And then we looked at verse 2. What does Peter want for his readers to get from this letter? The same way he closes it, he wants us to get grace and peace. He wants us to learn the, the, the way we get transformed is by His grace, and His grace brings us into the peace of being right with the Almighty under the shadow of His wing. How do we get there? How do we get His grace and peace? Well, he said through knowledge. Through knowledge, the channel of reservoir of God's grace is knowledge, epigenosis, that full knowledge. And, and Peter says it's the knowledge of Christ. This real knowledge of Christ, what that man just testified to, the Christ who pulls you out of a hole like that and gives you peace. Then we took a whole sermon trying to see how does this knowledge work? What, what does it mean to have epigenosis? And we looked at six aspects of it how that produces grace and peace. We looked at Jesus as a shepherd to lead and guide us and bring us to still waters and green grass. He's a husband who cares for his bride and is given to her to to purify and make us holy. He's a prophet who speaks truth to us and my sheep hear my voice. He's a priest who will lay his life down and die on a cross for your sins. He's a king ruling and reigning and will rule your life. And he's a friend. He sticks closer than a brother. He is the best friend. And, and those, knowing those things begin to change your life and let the grace of God flow. And then we closed out just showing you how that ties in to verse 3, that, that his divine power is granted everything we need for life and godliness, and it comes to the true knowledge of him who called you Uh, By His own glory and excellence, He calls you from death unto life. He calls you unto Himself. Power. And this morning, what I want to do now is we're going to look at verse 4. I'm going to try to tie this first part all together as we'll make a transition next week in verse 5 so that we can have right thinking and understanding to move on to godliness (coughs) that should flow into and out of our lives. This is where we're going to move. And this verse is the linchpin that holds the whole thing together between knowing the grace of God and this conduct that will come forth from it. So let me read verse 4. For by these, He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world by lust. So in verse 4, for by these, by, by what? Well, it points back to His calling us by His glory and excellence, His giving us life. He called you from death unto life. He gave you spiritual life in Him. And by doing this, He's granted to us something. When He did that, we got something, and He said, it's promises. You got promises of life and godliness. You got promises of restored union with God. You have communion with God. Concluding in verse 11 with a communion that will be perfect, perfected and uninterrupted for all of eternity. Everything that interrupts it here on earth and our fallenness, this communion with God is going to be removed. So it's going to be perfect and, and infinite forever and ever and ever. So what kind of promises are these that he gives to us? Peter says they're precious. He keeps talking about precious cornerstone, precious blood, and precious faith. And we have precious promises. They're so rich and beautiful, and they've been given to us. They're magnificent. That Greek word means large and great. The promises of God, they're, they're so big. They're mega. They're amazing. They're beautiful. And Peter says that so that by these promises, what? These amazing promises, you may become partakers of the divine nature. These promises do something really, really beautiful. Beautiful. (laughs) Remember back to Genesis 2. Sin. Adam and Eve were estranged and hiding from God after they were walking with Him in the garden. 
The presence of God has now been guarded by an angel with a sword that moves in every direction. There's no way back into the presence of God without justice being satisfied for your sin. Your sins must be punished by God. There's no way back into His presence without that sword getting satisfaction. So the presence of God has been shut off to everyone. We don't walk in the garden with God anymore when we're born into this world. We are estranged from God, alienated. We're at enmity with Him. We're separated from Him. That's the problem with mankind. You were made for God and you've been separated from Him. There is no relationship. There's estrangement. And then comes these amazing promises that we traced for the whole Christmas season. That there's going to be a seed that God was going to give that's going to bring us back to God in a relationship. And he would go under the sword of God's justice and he would break open the way back to God. He would go up on a cross and he would bear the justice of God for our sins so that we could come back into his presence. And and I want you to catch this, not just back into his presence, but even deeper, to actually be one with him. To be one with God. I in him, he in me, union, a vine and a branch. Better than just being back in his presence. We are one with God. He says you're a partaker of the divine nature. The Greek word for partaker is, is that word koinonia, which most of you have heard that word. There used to be a big movement called koinonia groups, which we call community groups, and all these different names. It's to, to get together and to share our lives. and our, uh, It talks in Acts, they shared their resources with one another. So that they, they had koinonia, they gave, they, they shared what they had of their persons, their possessions. It's just such a beautiful word. And Peter chooses that here by the Spirit. The promise is is that you now can share, have in common, partake of, and be one with God. You can have communion with God. you, You have koinonia with God. That's what he's saying. The promise of God is that we can become partakers of the divine nature. Don't like I've been preaching for weeks. Don't be satisfied away from God. The gospel is to bring you all the way into oneness with Him. You can be a partaker. You can have a relationship with Him. Fellowship, communion, intimacy, oneness. You don't have that. You don't have the Gospel. It brings you to have koinonia with the living God. Do you see that the Gospel is bigger than going back to what Adam had in that garden? You can be in the presence of God, but now you can be taken up into Him. You can be linked together in perpetual fellowship and oneness intimacy. The gospel is not just getting fire insurance so I don't go to hell, but I go to heaven. That is not it. It's so much bigger and more glorious than that. That's a part of it, but it's allowing you to not just come out from under the wrath of God, but to be brought into his favor, so much favor that now you can be a partaker of the divine nature of God. Koinonia with the Godhead. Let that take your breath away. From this place then, the power of God flows. And this is why I think that the church is missing so much power today. We don't get to this place. The grace of God that can conform you into His image. It's not just praying down blessings. God, give me this. It's dwelling with God. <clears throat> it's walking with Him in a deep, deep, close relationship. Remembering uh, that the gospel gave this to us. Peter's going to say, you forgot your forgiveness of your sins. The gospel gave you that. Remembering that his righteousness is the grounds of this relationship. So just realize it's his righteousness that is the grounds of my acceptance. My faith that I am loved and accepted by God. The life that I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's to walk in the Spirit. So the Christian life, it's not about fundamentalism. It's not just, here, here's the negatives, don't do them. I no longer smoke, drink, or chew, or go with girls who do. We don't do this. We don't sing those kind of songs. We don't dress this way. And you keep throwing all those things out there, and you leave people unchanged except externally, and that is not the power of the gospel. 
The gospel has magnificent promises that make you a partaker of the divine nature. Hebrews, the whole thing we've been seeing in there is that you can draw near to God. Romans 5, you can have peace with God and stand in grace. The glory of the new covenant is I can draw near to God to be a sharer, a partaker of the divine nature. Jesus said, uh, t- they said, teach us how to pray. Pray our Father. Intimacy. Be amazed at a God who has brought us back to Him at the greatest cost and given it to the greatest of sinners. Believe the gospel. Remember it. Because the devil's going to lie to you all your days. When you're sick and stuck in your own house, he's going to start playing with your mind and do these things that we just heard. That you don't have this glorious, precious promise of God and koinonia. It's a fellowship, guys, that cannot be broken. It's eternal. Christ's fellowship with the Father was broken at the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me so that yours never will be? Your fellowship, you will never have to say those words to God. Jesus heard those words and faced that consequence so that you will never, ever have to hear, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Nothing can separate us from His love, not even your sin. This is the sap and the power and the grace that flows into your branches from this vine so that life and godliness now will flow out of your life organically. This gospel is power. That's what He's been telling us again and again. It's power to change us from the inside to the out. It's not our power that just changes the externals. This is such a powerful gospel. It goes to the inside, cleanses consciences, changes hearts, renews affections, and begins to change the outward conduct. What will this look like? To walk in a relationship with God. To walk in these promises that I am His and He is mine. We're the sheep of His hand. He's with me. He's working everything for my good to conform me to the image of Christ. He's protecting me and he's keeping me from destroying myself because I would. Thomas Goodwin, a Puritan who I've been delighting in some of his writings, said this, The indwelling of Christ by faith is to have Jesus Christ continually in one's eye, a habitual sight of him. I call it so because a man actually does not always think of Christ. But as a man does not look up to the sun continually, yet he sees the light of it. So you should carry along and bear along in your eye the sight and the knowledge of Christ, so that at least a presence of him accompanies you, which faith makes. To live by faith is to live in light. I see everything in light of the reality of Christ. This will bear fruit. And what will that be? What's going to come out of this, guys? Well, in verse 4, he says that you're going to escape the corruption that is in the world by by lust. Becoming a partaker of the divine nature, there's a power that's going to come and it's going to help you escape the corruption that is in this world by lust. The, The Greek word is cosmos. To escape the cosmos, which means the badness of this world and its system, the fallenness of this world. It lies in the lap of the evil one. The whole system is fools who say there is no God. Six to seven billion people living all day long for their five senses. Fighting to get their piece of the pie. What will make me happy? Six billion people every day fighting for what will make them happy. Why do you think there's wars (laughs) and battles and hatred and enmities and families? You're willing to walk over anyone or anybody to get what you desire. All I want is my desires. That's what I live for. And I'll hurt. I'll do anything. I'll cheat. I'll lie. I'll do anything to get my desires. The whole system, this whole cosmos is built on selfish desire. It's everything. That's all it's about. Day by day, lusts ruling this world. People are frantic about fulfilling their lusts and their desires. Spending all of their money and time and dreams on their lusts. That's all it is. What will make me happy? I will deny myself now for one reason. I think something else will make me happy in the future. 
my retirement or that house I'm going to buy. Uh, the only way I'll stop my lust is because I think I can get more lust later. The only thing they don't believe that will make them happy is God. He will make me unhappy if He rules over me. We must avoid Him or create Him in a way that lets us live in our lust is what American Christianity has done. Here's a God who lets me just live any way I want. Not in Peter's book. Not in the Gospel. No one can escape the corruption of this world. You're born into it by nature. You're stuck. Try, you can try and try and try and you're never going to get it. You'll never break it. You'll just keep chasing your lust and be empty. People will try religion. And religion doesn't solve these lusts. You're sitting here maybe this morning and you're, you're trying religion and it has not changed your lusts. You still live for them. Come on Sundays and you do everything, but you, nothing has changed the inside. The law, all it does is increase them. Paul said, when the law said don't covet, it caused me to covet all the more. The law isn't going to fix it. We can try moralism, 12 steps programs. I need a new start. I need more education. Let's try rewards. Well, that didn't work. Well, let's try punishments. That doesn't work. There is no power to escape from the corruption that is in this world by our lusts and desires in our heart. I'm in prison to this system and this world, and I can't clean up and change my heart. There's no way out. So we conclude, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Just try to enjoy what lusts I can before I die is many people's motto. We're going to learn in the next chapter about the false teachers that were in this church. He says that they're, in 2 Peter 2, they're promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. These teachers in the church are saying, here, this teaching will give you freedom, and they're slaves of their own lusts. The corruption that is in this world, they're not free of it. For by what a man is overcome, by this he's enslaved. For if after they've escaped the defilements of the world... By the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse than the first. These false teachers can't get out of their own corruptions and what they're promising you, freedom. It's not working because it's not this gospel that we're looking at this morning. So much garbage out there in the church today that keeps promising freedom. As, as a pastor, I've seen this a thousand times. Freedom, freedom, freedom. And they've never been more slaves to sin in their lives. I pray that we're going to see the power of the gospel. Because Peter's saying here, this, this breaks into this corrupted world that's full of wrong lusts and desires. <clears throat> this is a promise. <clears throat> it's precious and a magnificent promise. It's, it's that you can be a partaker of the divine nature. You can see the true beauty of God. You can see the fullness of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And in Him, there's no darkness. He's lovely. He's beautiful. Goodness and mercy, grace, grace, God's grace. I can see it. Something a million times better and more beautiful and more satisfying than any lust I ever had in this world. Has that happened to your soul? Jesus Christ is so much better than any lust you ever chased or desired in this world. That's what Peter's getting at. You need this koinonia with God. It's like everything that I have ever chased or desired or had in this world is all rolled up in one person who's more satisfying than anything else. Everything else just gets eclipsed in the light of His glory and grace. I consider all things to be loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I might gain Christ. This is the only way of escape from the corruption of this world by less. This is what Mike just shared with us. These desires that cannot be fulfilled or quenched, has any relationship ever done it, guys? Has your 401k satisfied you? Have you taken a drug that really has satisfied you when you come off it? You're just full and not empty? No accolade is ever compared to this is my son and who I'm well pleased. 
No accolade will ever compare to that. No intimacy has ever left me as satisfied as this one with Christ. The only way to be set free, remember the Greek word is epithumias, over desires. The only way to get set free from all these epithumias running around in our hearts is to have a greater one. You'll never overcome it in willpower. You've got to fight desire with desire. You need a greater desire than your desires for wrong things, epithumias and the corruption of this world. You will never get over them without a greater desire desire. Thomas Chalmers, the, one of the great men, I can't remember what year he lived in, if it was 18 or 1700s, whatever, but he wrote a book called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. Look that up. I tell you this about every five years. Go read it, and his whole theme is that you can never overcome desires without this greater desire of Christ driving it out. It is the only way. This is the gospel means to change and transform us into the image of of Christ. You're never going to get out of your slavery to sin by just willing it so. Your epithumias are driving and dictating all your behavior, all your thoughts, and all your pursuits. Nothing can fix that. Can resolutions do it? The average resolution is broken in three days by January 3rd. Can snapping yourself with a rubber band? I tried it. Every time I had a wrong thought, I snapped that rubber band and it did nothing except hurt can asking for grace just do it some magical way i just need grace and boom you get it can going to bible studies seven nights a week keep it solve this can spending all your days with christians do it when i spend all my days with christians and not with christ i get as carnal as a goat can throwing away your tv your computer your cell phone can that fix this my dear brethren, there's only one remedy that God has given for our escape. Our escape from the epithumias of this world are a greater desire to eclipse the power of all those other promised pleasures in this world apart from Him as a partaker of the divine nature. That's it. I have koinonia with Christ. And that's so sweet to me. And as I do it, He's saying it's going to drive out these epithumias. Have you lost this somewhere along the way? Have you just become a moral reformer? Did you replace a vibrant relationship with Christ for external religion? Did you lose your first love and all of your service and study of doctrine? Did you lose Christ? Is there a secret to the Christian life? Paul said one thing. One thing I do I reach toward, toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He said that I, I may know him. I, I just want to know Christ deeper, deeper, and more experiential. That was the pursuit of Paul. The gift of faith is to look at Christ and to look your eyes out again and again and again at him. To take this beautiful Bible that points to him from cover to cover and have an epigenosis of him. To believe the grace of God, to truly have been brought into full and final fellowship with God, to really believe that with faith, to never get over it, to live into its fullness, and this gives you everything pertaining to life and godliness. <clears throat> so let's pull and out, and I just want to take a look at this now and we'll close up. Knowledge is how grace and peace flow. To have grace and peace multiplied in your life, it comes through knowledge. But not just cold, dead knowledge. Don't mistake the two. But it's knowledge that says the promises of God are precious and magnificent. They're mine. And the gift of faith allows you to see that. They're mine. Even my sins have been forgiven. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. They're mine. These promises have life. They're for me. <laughs> That's what changed his life. I'm a partaker of the divine nature. The fullness of God's grace. This is my promise. These promises and knowledge of Christ then have power to transform us. To give us a greater desire for him than the lust that once ruled our hearts. Every desire we ever had is met and bettered in Christ. Amen? 
Every one of them are better than Christ. I look for no other. I need no other. I just want him. So help me, pastor. What is this going to look like day to day practically? I don't need to live up here theologically. How do I live this? How do I do this? This can't just be big theological concepts. I need it to overcome my lust for money and approval and my own agenda and women. I need this to work in real daily life. So I get up in the morning. I fight my lust for more sleep because I've found my time in the Word always gives me more energy than 30 more minutes of sleep. And I read. <clears throat> Not just I read the Robert Murray McShane reading guide and check off my four chapters. I, I, it's your epithemia. I hate failing at anything, so I read my four chapters. That isn't it. I, f- I read it and I find Christ. And I find a promise about Him, a magnificent promise. And I meditate on it all day. And while I'm driving to work or making breakfast or getting your kids ready, I look at it. And I have to give life again to my desires. My, I, I wish my desires just stayed even. They don't. And so I've got to give fuel to my desires. I have to fight desire with desire. I have to get my desires aligned every morning. When I wake up, I just, my desires aren't right. And what, what do I want to live for today? Think about God and His grace. My heart starts to rise up again. And it's, I want to be pleasing to you. My favorite thing, this is just practical application, live 30 minutes from where you work. Okay, you've got to drive 30 minutes. That's how long it takes me to reorient my mind and my affections. And what do I live for? What do I want out of life? What, what is my main ambition? I start there. And by the time I pull up to the church, my affections are, I just want to live for Jesus Christ today with everything. Nothing can draw my heart away unless I believe it will make me happier than my fellowship with the living Christ. Nothing will ever win unless I think that will make me happier. So this is where the battle is waged and won. This is the fight of faith. And we have to help each other keep it. I need you to remind me that Jesus is better than anything this world has to offer. I need you to do that. You did that for me this week. I, I'm just, I love going to help you guys because I'm coming away encouraged every time I meet with any of you. You're, you're suffering, you're battling cancers, and every time I come, you're worshiping Jesus Christ. And I drive away going, I love him. He's sufficient. He's beautiful. This is unbelievable to get to be a part of what God is doing. This is the fight of faith. I need you to help me. And Lone Rangers have one thing in common. Lust that they can't overcome. Sins that are glaring and not getting mortified. I am watching the people who don't plug into the body of Christ get older and be so broken because they didn't let people into their lives and say, you know what? That's wrong when you're, when you're ugly like that. That's wrong when you treat your wife that way. You need other people in your life to come and, and help shine the light and tell you and point you that Jesus is better than getting mad at your wife. So you gotta, you got to plug in. You're not going to do this on your own. Lone rangers do a bad job of keeping Christ first and foremost. We need each other. I can't tell you how many times someone in this body has reminded me and lifted my heart again to the glories and the beauties of this gospel. And I remember, I remember And I just want Christ and Christ alone. In his presence, temptations lose their power. Amen? Repentance is key. Faith is key. And the promises of God and in Christ. This is the hardest battle I've ever fought in my life. It's the simplest because it's it's just that. But it's the hardest thing I've ever fought in my life. To keep myself in the love of Christ. To fight daily for this relationship should be the easiest thing I've ever done. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. To nurture it. To truly repent when I hurt it. Do you repent when you hurt such sweetness? That's what grieves me about sin the most. Repent. Go to God. Get restored in your fellowship. And I'll tell you, those who want to fight this fight, the reward in verse 11 is the perfect, uninterrupted marriage for all of eternity with this Christ. Eternal bliss to the one who will not let go of this one who's altogether lovely. Do you know what would happen with a whole church that gets this? 
fighting to have and enjoy fellowship with Christ daily, believing the gospel so fully, flipping it over again and again, and every time we sin with doubt and despair, we'll find full assurance. And full assurance will be diligent to live holy lives, flowing and producing moral excellence that will abound in love. May God grant us the grace and peace. May it be multiplied through this knowledge of Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Next week, how does he bring this about? And we're going to spend a whole sermon looking about how does he bring this about in verses 5 through 7. How does all of grace tie with applying all diligence? And if you don't get this, you're going to shipwreck yourself. And so we'll, we'll come back next week and ask if, if the Lord tarries or I'm still alive. We'll, if I die, whatever elder steps up, finish Second Peter. Okay, so at least we know you got that. But if Christ comes back, you don't need Second Peter. Okay, you're done. Fellowship forever, uninterrupted. Let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, for the beauty of this word. I can't get over this phrase that I'm a partaker of the divine nature. Oh God, teach us the fullness of what that means. By your spirit, lead and guide us into the depth of what we can share with you in relationship. Oh God, the power is there. The power comes from that. It isn't an ATM card, it's a savior. God, let us love him and trust him and believe and draw near and commune and abide with this sweet Christ. And the fruit will be Christ-like. And so I pray, Lord, that you will do that in our midst. And so I'm crying for just overwhelming desire for the one thing in every heart here this morning. God, please give them that. I pray for anyone who walked in here without Jesus Christ, Lord. They're they're stuck in these epithemias. They can't change their desires. And they, and they, they need your gospel. I pray that you show them that right now and that they would call upon the living Christ to save them from this despair. Corruption that has brought the wrath of God on them. And there's a way out through one who bore that wrath on a cross, through one who lived that life they should have and is willing to give that full credit to their account so that they can have peace with God and can have fellowship with the creator of the universe. God, would you grant that to anyone who walked in here this morning without it? God, we thank you for the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. And we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.